Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. As host to Whitetail Rendezvous, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for almost 100,000 iTunes downloads. Thank you to the 300 guests who've been on the show. And thank you to over 30,000 followers on social media. Couldn't do this show without every single one of you. And secondly, sometimes the sound quality isn't radio quality, isn't um, recording room quality. It is what it is. People might be in a tree stand, a box line. They might be sitting in their pickup truck on a hillside. Or they might be traveling to and from a, a block or home from work. They're all over. And because of that, sometimes the quality isn't what you would expect or would have hoped for. Neither am I. White Tail Rendezvous Podcast number 301. Another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. Today, we're going to head up to Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. We're going to meet with Jim Campbell. Had Jim on the show about six or eight months ago, and a lot of things have changed. And One thing, a little background on Jim, uh, about nine years ago, he was in a hunting camp, and he watched pe- guys filming. He decided to get involved in it. And about five years ago, something very important uh, happened to Jim. He, he did some filming for a uh, family you hear about him on the show. And he says, it was at that moment I knew in my heart what I wanted to do for this so others could enjoy. Hey, listeners, don't forget to text 33444 Food Plot for your free Food Plot ebook. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Roundup. This is your host. And folks, this is episode number 301. You already heard that, but that's special because uh, we've done over 300 episodes. We're heading to Madison, Wisconsin, just outside of Madison, Wisconsin, and we're going to uh, connect with Jim Campbell. Jim does a lot of work. He's a freelance videographer, and he is currently working with Red Feather Media. Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, Bruce, thanks much. Say, Jim, you know, long ago, I, I think about it, um, you know, you had to be one of the first 20, 30 people on the show. And I, and as we we're doing a warm-up, I had to reminisce that you pulled over the side of the highway and uh, and we did the show. You were sitting in your car. So, you know, it, it's nice to uh, circle back around and, and, and talk to old friends. So what the heck's been going on in your life since we last talked? Uh, Bruce, I remember that day for sure. Today I'm a little bit more comfortable. I'm actually in my office, so a little bit warmer. Nothing's moving around me, so life has been good. Um, I've gotten more and more into videography and photography. I started working for Open Season TV up based out of Indiana last season. I filmed for them last year and this year, and most recently Red Shutter Media down in Hot Springs, Arkansas, has contracted me, and I'm doing just a ton of work for those guys, so it's a uh, it's just exciting times right now. Well, it is, and 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 forgive me, uh, listeners. It's Red Shutter. I I think I said Red Feather. I was thinking of Red Feather Lakes up here in Colorado. My bad. But um, you know, tell me, you know, let's go back a little bit. And how did you get into this? Because I remember you you telling me way back when it was about creating memories. Well, you're doing more than that now. So let's let's just give the listeners a little background and then really dig into what it means to be in the outdoors and be a freelance um, videographer. Sure. Well, about nine years ago, my wife was a big bow hunter, and she and I were sharing a camp down in Illinois, and we had two different TV crews in camp at the same time. It was my first exposure to that, and I was running around with my little JVC Handycam, and these guys had big cameras, and I was impressed. I've always enjoyed videography and photography and just being around them and listening to them and and seeing their excitement and enthusiasm was really contagious and we left there and they had the attitude that look i'm gonna i'm gonna pursue this more and more and i did i started you know paying more attention to the shows and watching you know what did i like what did i not like on on shows i was watching and uh then about five years ago i had an opportunity to video 
uh, father and son in Wisconsin. I put on Facebook uh, an offer to go volunteer my time to video somebody for the youth hunt. And a father up by Eau Claire contacted me. And he has a 10-year-old son with autism, and he'd never shot a deer. So I, I volunteered to go up for the weekend. It's only a two-day hunt. And that first afternoon, the young man shot his first deer. It was a doe. And I had the camera rolling on a tripod. I turned it around. I ex- instructed the father that, you know, I want you guys to tell me exactly what just happened and, and what you're feeling. And as they started talking back and forth, and particularly the father telling the story, I actually started to cry. You know, so here I am standing behind the tripod, and I'm, I'm bawling. And I told those guys right then and there, I said, you know what? I said, this is what I want to do, being able to capture those memories for other people so they can, you know, they can always look back on this. And they're always going to have that video to reflect on. And, and that was it. That was a life-defining moment for me. Wow. Um you know, just just think of it, folks. And, and this episode's going to be uh, about Jim Campbell's journey and and what he's doing now. And, and we're going to take it apart because I know there's hundreds of you who want to get into, um, you know, filming your hunt, um, filming the outdoors, doing a, a lot of things. And and Jim has invested in it. Let's talk about your investment and what you decide to do in terms of cameras and schools and in your opinion, what it really takes to get good at your craft. Yeah, I think really what it takes is the attitude and the desire, and I mean the true love. You know, everybody says they want to be a cameraman, and you've got to understand, I mean, I've been on the road for months. I mean, months and months already this year. Um, You know, you might get home for three days after a three-week trip only to leave again. So, I mean, it takes a special relationship at home. But, it, I mean, to get up and do your job 12, 14, 16 hours every day for three weeks straight for less than minimum wage, you know, in many cases, once you figure out how many hours you're working, you better really love it, not just like it a lot. Because that's it'll break you down mentally, it'll break you down physically, and you've got to be willing to put the time in, you know, just up front to do, to do the job. Beyond that, I think I was fortunate that I went to three different camera schools put out by Rusted Rooster over in Michigan. And I invested early in the education, not so much the equipment. And I learned what does it take to shoot good video, to shoot you know good photos, to do some editing. Um, and I just see too many young guys, especially, that are all worried about they've got to have the latest, greatest, best camera with all the attachments on it. And then I see them running the thing on full auto. And I just, you know, I, I try to help them and say, y- you guys really just need to go to some schools and learn how to use what you have. Because technically running a camera is such a small part of the equation. But being able to create and tell a story effectively, uh, you know, that comes from the heart. That, you know, that is something that really matters when you look at somebody's footages. You know, are they a good storyteller? You know, and it is the story. And in, in, in the warm up, we talked about uh, your commitment of time, and you just kind of uh, overlap that you've been on the road and, and doing things. You know, realistically, to, to get good at your craft and, and do the things that the people you're working for, you know, seriously, what what is the time commitment? Well. To get good at your craft, you said, I'm, I'm not sure that we're ever good at our craft. <laughs> you know, and, and I say that lovingly, I guess, because the, the people who are good at their craft are the ones who never give up learning. And that is huge. Um, there are a lot of people in this business who seem to know everything about everything. And then there are guys that get up every day and try to learn something, just one thing. And in order to be good at your craft, you need to have that attitude. Now, how long does that take? You know, I think a guy that has the ability to listen and is creative generally can go out in a season if they put the right time in, you know, and go out in a season and really excel. You know, it's not rocket science. Again, it's being able to creatively tell a story, push the right buttons on the camera, you know. So the technical aspect of it can be taught pretty much in a weekend. And then applying that is is the challenge. You, you've got to make the time to go do it. During a hunt is not the time to go figure out your camera. You've got all summer long. Go figure out your camera. Go, you know, video ducks down the lake. You know, go go do something with your camera. Figure it out and, and learn that camera inside and out. Um, but, I, you know, I think a year or two into it, and especially if you go to some schools, that can shortcut you dramatically. I mean, I learned more in schools in three days than I've learned myself in the first four years. So I think committing to schools is huge. What type of investment do you think um, is the minimum 
that a person should make if they're going to get into uh, this side of the outdoor industry? Sure. You know, today's cameras are just shy of amazing what you can get for the money. And if I was a, you know, a weekend hunter and my buddy and I decided we want to go film ourselves, there are both, you know, Sony and Canon camcorders. They're small, compact, um, easily under $1,500 that shoot amazing video. And those are great, you know, starter intermediate level cameras. I, you know, so for under $2,000, you can get complete packages, everything that you really need to go to go film your hunts. I would say that, you know, for new guys getting into this, consider buying something used because if you're like me, you're either going to buy things that are inexpensive and then replace them in six months or you're going to buy something you know, inexpensive and decide to upgrade it within a year. Um, so you're really losing money. And I guess if I had to do it all over again, I would probably buy nothing but, you know, quality used equipment to get started until I really figure out exactly, you know, where do I want to be? And listen, so I'll just share this a, a long time ago, um, really a long time ago. I'm 70 years old now. So fit. Some 50 years ago when I started this, a um, guy named Harry Shear who hunted out west and I hunted um, – with his uh, brother-in-law and he said Hutch he said if you're going to go hunting and I can see the fire in your eyes and he said just remember this buy the best quality equipment you can possibly get and a rifle's a rifle but your optics are actually just as important or maybe more important and so buy good optics for your rifle and, and binoculars and, uh, and or spotting scope. And I never forget that. And I transferred that to all my clothing, everything I have. I try to buy the best I can afford. Now, everybody can't go out and buy Swarovski's or Leica's uh, in the top end, but there's plenty of good um, companies uh, out there. Um, Vortex Optics is, is a company right there in Madison, Wisconsin that I have a relationship with. So just – you know, do the best you can because that it'll pay you dividends down the road. I have a I have a Bushnell um, compact spotting scope that I bought for my first trip out to Wyoming in 1975, and it's still operational. Right. So, you know, well, and a lot of guys say that they can't afford, you know, I'll use wireless mics as an example because I did this. I did this personally. I was looking for a wireless mic system for my first one, and I didn't want to spend the $800 on a good, a really good set. So I spent $200 on a cheap set. Well, they sound like a cheap set. And within a couple months, I had to spend the $800 to get the good ones. So, so you have to ask yourself and say, well, I can't afford just to buy the good ones. Well, if you can't afford to buy the good ones, how on, on earth can you afford to waste money on the cheap ones? You're better off just saving your money or buying good used ones. You know, I guess, and that's more my point is, is buy the best that you can. And sometimes that means used and that's okay. Do you get to use stuff off eBay or what some of the sources that you use if you need a piece of equipment that you go, hey, I know what it costs new, um, but how, how do you find good used equipment? I guess that's what I'm asking. eBay is a great source. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff is guaranteed and eBay stands behind it. And so it's, it's, it's very secure that way. B&H Photo uh, is, you know, a worldwide leader in cameras and audio. And they have a used department. Um, and then I've bought from them in the past also. So e either one of those sources is fine. And there, there are others out there. But B&H is probably my go-to uh, website. So, um, Jim, if somebody wants to get a hold of you and say, you know, I, I am serious about this and, um, heck, you started later in life. You were you were a custom home builder in the Madison area and decided to get involved in this just nine years ago. So, folks, it's, it's an open door and there's more opportunity today than ever. And, uh, Jim, comment on that for me because everybody sees the proliferation of YouTube and, and this and that and in all different platforms, but there's more opportunity in my, in my, um, viewpoint. There, there is. And especially, I shouldn't say especially, but for a videographer, the biggest problem that TV shows or pro staff or anybody else has with videographers is generally the videographer gets involved because they want to end up in front of the camera. I'm completely the opposite. I want nothing to do with being on film. I want to be the guy behind the camera. Um, so if that's what you want, I think it's an easier path. But again, it goes back to you've got to be willing to put in the time and, and learn the trade rather than just pushing a record button. 
that. Um, you know, and it, this goes back to going to schools and practice. And there's a, there's a number of TV shows that actually offer apprenticeships, uh, you know, starting in the off season where you can go and get some hands-on training and, and potentially that can work into a full-time job as well. How does somebody reach out to you, Jim? Well, I'm on Facebook, Jim Campbell from Mount Horeb, Wisconsin, and I've also got a group on Facebook. If you're interested, you you need to ask to be included in the group. I don't publicly just add people, but it's called Filming the Hunter Behind the Scenes. And I started that group kind of as a help group um, for for guys coming into, I shouldn't say young guys, anybody coming into videography uh, that has questions. It's a group of people that are at all different skill levels, so beginners to experts, and it's all about helping each other and answering questions. And that's one problem in this industry is if you do have a question, it's hard to find somebody to actually answer your question without them just bragging about themselves, I think. And I mean, there's plenty of good guys out there, but I want to make sure that at least I can create a forum where everybody's very comfortable asking asking those questions. In the warm up, we talked about accomplishments. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you? Accomplishments? Yes. Well, being able to sit back and watch a TV show on Pursuit Channel or Sportsman Channel, knowing that you made those shots, that you created that, and watching the others have success, to me, is the most fun. Um, I'm not in this for personal gain. I'm not in it to have my name plastered all over. Just watching the hunters and the guides and whoever you're filming, you know, the interaction between them and the fun that they have, when it all goes right and you get it captured, uh, that's special because you know that you've done something for someone else. And at this point in my life, uh, that means more to me than anything else. It's it's you know it's permanent. They have it to always go back and reflect that. Wow, that's a that's a really powerful statement, listeners. If you heard that, um, the money didn't come in, the, the credits didn't come in. That hey, look at me, didn't come in. It's just he, uh, Jim, has the pride that a job well done is a job well done, and and he's getting a tremendous amount of uh, pleasure out of that. That's unique in today's society, I would think, Jim. You know, I'm on Facebook all the time and all the social media, and there's a lot of – and I'm guilty of it too. Hey, look what I did yesterday or hey, look what I just did. And I love to see, you know, the down deer or buck, big buck down. I love sharing that. I love sharing the journey. But but sometimes I think – and like I said, I've been guilty of it uh, myself, and I hope I'm getting better. But, you know, it's like, hey, look at me, look at me. And your thoughts on that, Jim? Well, yeah, I do. I, I don't mind the hey, look at me if you're going to take the time to answer every question then. You know, I, I see guys that post every day. They post amazing pictures. I had a guy yesterday post an amazing photo on, on Facebook and I replied to him. I said, you know, that's a great picture. What were your settings? What camera did you use? Because again, I wake up every day wanting to learn something and I just want to know exactly how did he do what he did. And he replied to me instantly and told me everything that I asked. That's very rare. Um, I shouldn't say it's very rare. It's, it's more rare than it is common. And, you know, Again, I don't mind the, hey, look at me, look at this amazing photo, but then turn around and help people learn how you did that, because that's what that's what I'm about is how, how can we grow as, you know, in industry, if you will, you know, get more and more guys involved in this because it's good for everybody. You don't have to be worried that somebody's going to steal your photo or steal your video or steal your techniques. I mean, there's plenty of work to go around. So, you know, help each other along the way and, and then watch their success. I mean, it's really fun when somebody actually learns what an F-stop is because they had no clue what, you know, <laughs> what, what, what is an F-stop, you know, but they've been, and they've been filming for three years, oh. you know, so, so it's, uh, it, it's fun. I, I really enjoy helping almost to the point where uh, it, it consumes me some days where guys have so many questions, but that's okay. That's a, it, it's a good thing. Yeah, I, I'm sitting here laughing because oh, it was 19. What the heck was it? Uh, 80. That'd be 81, 80. I'm gonna call it 85. So um, I I was hunting. You know, I've been hunting out west since uh, in the mid 70s, and so I said I'm gonna get a good camera. I'm gonna get a good camera. So I made a couple of bucks at work, and and I can remember going. Um, I was in New York City anyway, and so I went to 
oh, what's the famous uh, street, 37th Street photo, or I, I think that's it. Oh, in, yeah. In New York City. So I went there and, and bought a Nikon body and, and, and lenses. Right. And back then, I spent – you know, I spent a couple of bucks, and uh, but it was the best I could get. And I just remember I had to learn about all the stuff because today you pick up a good Nikon digital camera, put it on automatic, and you'll get good pictures. You won't get great pictures, but you'll get good pictures. And as Jim just alluded to, um, you know, he asked the guy, you know, what his f-stop was. So if you don't know what an f-stop was, just Google it and start learning about what you're holding in your hand because it'll make you better. Your thoughts, Jim? Yep, that's absolutely right. Um, again, too many guys are worried about do I have the latest and greatest cameras? And, you know, I, I can equate that to rifles. Do I need to spend $5,000 to get a custom made 300 wind mag with a 24 power scope to go out west and kill an elk at, you know, 300 yards? No, because I can only shoot so well anyhow. And my, you know, 1965 seven millimeter mag is going to do just as good a job with me pulling the trigger. So the point is, until your abilities have outgrown your equipment, don't waste the money upgrading. Until your abilities have outgrown your equipment, don't waste your money. And I think that's really important. In the warm up, we, we, I talked about your elevator, you know, pitch, hey, or, you know, a coffee shop or whatever um, pitch. So I, I, see you in a shop and I realized, you know, you're an outdoors guy and, and you know, you, you smiled at me when I smiled at you and I said, Hey, what do you do? Right. Well, I get to chase people around the country with cameras and video cameras recording their every move and I actually get paid to do it. And, and that's a pretty darn cool thing. Yeah, it is. And just, uh, you said you've been traveling a lot. What states uh, were you in, and what type of game were you were you filming? If if it's not a you know over, I guess twenty. <laughs> right. um, we started off the end of August, first September in Utah, chasing mule deer. We went from Utah immediately to Colorado, chasing mule deer, and the hunter I was filming there shot his biggest ever mule deer with a bow. It was two or three and six eighths. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We came home for a couple of days. We went up to Manitoba for bear hunting and then to Alberta for an elk hunt and then Alberta for moose. Came back home for a short stay and went to New Mexico for elk and antelope. And again, the same hunter shot his first bull elk with a muzzle loader and biggest antelope ever with a rifle. So this guy shot three of his biggest ever on camera this year. And you talk about rewarding. I mean, he could have gone and done that without a camera. Well, actually, he couldn't because he's on a TV show. But let's just say he could have. But being there when somebody makes an accomplishment, especially like that, you know, his first or biggest. And we got three of them for him on film this year. You know, that was just amazing. You know, then after that, we've been down in Kansas and Texas, and I leave bright and early tomorrow morning to head back down to northeast Arkansas to film a duck hunt, and right from there, we're going back down to south Texas, and I think Mississippi after that, so I'll be home right before Christmas. I was going to ask you, are you going to make it home for Christmas? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you know, everybody looks and said, wow, that's a little over 100 days, and she's probably been on the road for most of it. Um, does, do you have a down season? Well, uh, for the hunting show industry, there is a down season for sure. Um, now, with Red Shutter Media, they're a full production company. So besides filming for several different shows, they also do commercials and sponsor shots and all, all this type of other thing, which really, really interests me. I hadn't even thought about that until this year. But uh, any chance to be creative is kind of what gets me going. It's not just going to film a hunt. I mean, if we get to go shoot a commercial for, let's say, uh, Scent Crusher products, you know, in August and or July, and I get to be really creative on where are we going to go, how are we going to do this. That's what gets my juices flowing. That's what I like so much about videography and photography is, you know, at the end of the day, it's pretty much all an art form, uh, you know, and it's subjective. Some people like your art, some people don't like your art. Um, but being able to pursue that and, and, you know, and figure out, look, I like doing things this way um, and making that grow is, that's really fun. Do you ever get to a point or will you get to the point that your your work becomes your signature and somebody who's in the industry looks at it and said Jim Campbell did that they don't even have to see the credits yeah I don't know if it will or not um 
you know, I watch a lot of different shows and there are certain shows I like and certain shows I don't like. And I guess photography is a better example of that. I'm really, really big on storytelling. And when I look at a photo, whether it's one of mine or somebody else's, I want to understand why that shutter button was pushed at that particular time. And, and what is that photo really trying to tell me? And they can be very simple photos and they can be very elaborate photos. But to me, I have a, I have a real need to understand a story and whatever I see. Like hopefully, you know, the better I get, the more I'll be able to convey that to others. When I started in this process, uh, a gentleman named Judd Cooney, who's written hundreds of articles, uh, right. probably more than that, and taken hundreds. Of, I've seen, I've been in his house and, and seen the one, the file cabinets of a print, and then his stored uh, over a hundred thousand pictures, mm-hmm. mostly, you know, all sorts of critters, you know, and he told me. At that time, he said, Bruce, if you're going to get in the outdoor industry, if you're going to have your podcast, you want to tell stories because the photo is is what people want to see. And then the the word, the content is just the uh, brief explanation of what that is, what they're viewing. Mm-hmm. Your thought? Well, I, I agree. Um, you know, if, if all you're doing is a photo you don't necessarily have the opportunity to explain it. So it, it needs to be done right, you know, from the from the get-go. And, you know, there's a lot of technical things that we could talk about, what makes a good photo, what doesn't make a good photo. But somebody should be able to look at that instantly and say, I love it, or it's just a nice photo, or it's a bad photo, you know, one of the three. And whether or not they even realize they understand the story behind it, uh, subconsciously, I believe they do, and I believe that's what makes you know, a good photo and one that you look at and it just makes sense. You're not searching for subject matter. You look at it and you know exactly what you're looking at and why. Wow. Um, You've got, you know, you've got a lot of insight and it's amazing, you know, from my point of view, Jim, the growth that um, that I'm hearing, you know, in the 16 months, 14 months, whatever, you know, uh, it was when we first had you on the show. Congratulations, man. You know, uh, you're doing a heck of a job. Hey, thanks. So, um unbelievable but we're at the soft stop of the show so why don't you give a shout out um take 90 seconds 120 seconds and then we'll wrap the show right yeah you know i'd like to thank uh, a couple people open season tv they were the first you know legitimate tv show to take a chance on me uh, Chuck Paddock, James Blankenbeckler, and Clay Gilbert. I, I appreciate the opportunity that they gave me and the support they showed me and being able to work with a new guy and, you know, get behind the scenes, so to speak. Now Rob Schneider, Bo Schneider down at Red Shutter Media. These guys are amazing. Uh, it's super exciting. Uh, I think our future together is extremely bright. Uh, we're going lots of places, doing lots of things, constantly learning, growing, and uh, it's, it's been a great time and I look forward to the future for sure. Well, Jim Campbell, from uh, Wisconsin, thank you so much for being on the guest, and I look forward to you know meeting up uh, a year from now and, and seeing what new developments have happened and um, see what um, where your work has taken you. And one of these times, just like you mentioned, the guy um, I know he's on a TV show, so I don't know if I'd ever be able to get him on a podcast, but that that would be a great guy to have on the, on the show. So if that ever works, uh, let me know. So on behalf of Whitetail Rendezvous uh, podcast all across North America, uh, Jim Campbell, thank you so much and, and Merry Christmas to you, sir. Thanks, Chris. Make sure you listen to the next episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. We're going to head down south, Ashland City, Tennessee to be in fact, and visit with Ben Moore. Ben's on pro staff or team member for American Roots Outdoors with Alex and Linda Rutledge. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.